Good evening, everyone. Well, after that power pack performance, I think the energy of this space has also risen so much. And I'm very excited now to be speaking to the flag bearers of India Inc. 2.0 for this session. And uh, the next generation leaders from uh, the largest conglomerates of Indian uh, businesses which have a legacy of so many decades and even centuries. So uh, first up, I'd like to invite on stage my first guest, Shashwat Koinka, who we all know is the vice chairperson of the RPSG group which has a 200-year-old legacy, 35 companies in all, in various sectors. And of course, Keshav Reddy is going to be with us on the stage as well. And he is at the forefront of the GVK group. And as his Insta bio really says, that he's built uh, your airports before, and now he's building identities with his... Uh, a new company which is Equal, which is a digital identity company and we'll find out more about it during our discussion. Uh, welcome to both of you and thank you thank so you. much for joining me on this discussion. And the session is titled My Generation, My Rules, Leadership in a Disruptive World. So Shashwat, let me begin by you. You know, does it really happen in uh, family businesses which have a legacy of 200 years old and successful uh, legacy at that, that, you know, really my generation, my rules, or are you given a secret recipe that, you know, we know how we, we run businesses and this is how you should run too? Right. So for us, our business is over 220 years old, right? Um, so I think there is a huge legacy, but for us, um, I think with legacy comes a huge sense of responsibility. And, and I think the whole idea for us is how do you grow that legacy? and build on that legacy that you have. Um, so I think um, there's no secret success mantra or anything that you get, but I think uh, this culture of growing that legacy, not just maintaining, but actually adding value to it, is something that's ingrained in us from the, very, from the time when we are born, I think. So it's just innate in us to kind of try and do a lot better and build on what we have. So you always knew that you're going to be joining the family business. So, you know, to be fair, um, when I was graduating from college, I had that option. Uh, and to be fair, mom, dad, my grandparents, no one kind of imposed that this is what you need to do. Uh, but I think somewhere I knew that, one, India is where all the action is at. Um, the, and at that point, this was in 2012, um, you know, I was very certain that the next century is going to be that of India's. And, and I think the kind of responsibility you can get in your own business is it takes, you get, you get that much faster and at a much, much younger age than you would if you were working outside, so. Okay, Keshav, let me bring you in in that conversation. So you've been a part of the core business of GVK. You've been uh, building some of the exceptional airports in India. And now you're venturing out to build Equal and uh, many more startups you've uh, funded as well, especially in the digital ecosystem, in the FinTech world as well. Tell me, you know, what is easier and what is more difficult? Uh, to grow the businesses in the scale that you're expected to or to venture out on your own and set up something of your own? No, thank you, Sakshi, and thank you, everyone here. Um, I think taking a step back, you know, the world when my grandfather started GVK in the 70s was very different, and today is extremely different. Software and technology is at the core of every business today. And in terms of that, if you see three decades ago, 10 of the largest companies in the world were oil and gas companies. In the decade after that, we're all Chinese banks. And then this decade are all software companies. And, you know, I think in the last one, two months, it's actually had uh, two AI companies come into that. So the world is changing, and so should we. So I think family businesses, as we see it, has also, have also evolved quite uh, significantly over the years. So what we have done is we've moved to a family office construct wherein we build businesses with software at the core of it, but at the exterior of it, they're actually just old school businesses as well. So I think there's a great blend that's going to happen with India, and we just saw that earlier as well, with uh, the new India, right? The energy, the, the excitement that's there. Uh, I think we all are moving towards a new India with even family businesses progressing to being family offices and investing in you know, new businesses. Absolutely, Shashwan, would you want to add to that? Because you know, uh how difficult is it to uh, have family offices also evolve in that way because the world is changing at a very rapid pace and it's very difficult to stay uh, catching up with everything that's changing. So how difficult is it and how do you do it? 
You know, you mentioned we're a 200 year old business. Uh, we are, but I think what we did 200 years ago and what we do today are very different. And I think taking a cue of what Keshav said as well is the whole idea is you have to continuously keep evolving. And I think earlier it was a generational involvement. Each generation evolved that business, added new businesses within the fold of the family business. But I think what's changing now is, is the world is changing every couple of years. And so you have to figure out what is it that you want to be in and your business model has to be that dynamic to be able to change with the changing expectations. Okay. Uh, so Shashwat also, you know, of course, this is a very diverse group that you come in from. Of course, it has old age businesses, energy, it has, uh, of course, and all those FMCG businesses, you are now at the forefront of Too Yum as well. Uh, IT is evolving with first source solutions, then you have music and entertainment with Sare Gama as well, and where Caravan has been a very big success for you. So some of the innovations we're already seeing, but are there, uh, do you feel torn when you're pulled in so many directions? Uh, 35 businesses in various sectors or do you keep your focus to some certain uh, segments of the business where you're more passionate about and you have a great vision going forward and taking the next leg of the growth going forward? So I think, uh, you know, for us, uh, it's a two-pronged strategy. So, so one is uh, businesses which are either legacy businesses or large businesses within the group. Uh, they may be having um, an old world uh, origination. But the idea is how do you get them set up for success over the next decade or two, right? Uh, so when you really look at our um, electricity generation and distribution business, which was primarily thermal, the idea is how do you move into now renewable sources of energy? How do you kind of move from being, a, you know, from a purely utility perspective to a consumer first company, right? And, and similarly, for all of the businesses, the idea is really how do we convert them to become consumer first? So whether it's FMCG, whether it's media, whether it's music, entertainment, whether it's retail, whether it's um, first source for that matter, we want to touch consumers and make consumers' lives better. And, and you know, when you really look at India and the world at large, I think the consumer story is still yet to unfold and we want to be at the forefront of that. Keshav, okay. you're building equal. Tell us more about it because we do know how hugely successful Aadhaar was and uh, now you're talking about digital identity. But the moment you talk about digital identity, everybody has this fear that whether my data is uh, you know, protected at all costs or not, we are still at the policy stage. We do not know how uh, protection policies will shape up going forward from here. But uh, And deep fakes is another problem that has now emerged in our uh, senses. How do you think you're going to be building a foolproof product right there? I think the Aadhaar and the DPI are phenomenal and they've done, uh, they've put India on the map in all respects. Uh, what we are doing at Equal is leveraging that to build a nicer, a simpler experience for a consumer. And the, the, the purpose of Equal is to power identity for 100 million Indians. And we use the word power because today it's in your hands. Digital has made every Indian very um, responsible and the control of that is with your hands. And I think the new DPDP Act uh, is going to be just helping that and pushing those boundaries where consumer with consent will do what he wants. And I think we're the leaders in the world in, in respect of that as well. We talk about data digitization, but we talk about data democracy where you use your data for your benefit. So I think uh, it's going to be phenomenal the next decade with data and Indians are going to be at the center of it. I mean, we just saw earlier, that's the new Bharat today. It's amazing. And uh, the kind of platforms that are there today in the next decade, it's, it's really India's time in order to do all of that. Okay. Uh, Shashwat, you're also passionate about cricket and we do know that you own uh, the Lucknow Super Giants and it was the most expensive purchase in terms of IPL. Uh, tell me, you know, how do you foresee it? Was it like just a passion? Uh, uh, you know, passionate acquire acquisition when it comes to um, cricket or does it really have the thought process of a business going behind it? Will it really add value to the conglomerate going forward? So I think this was also a step to move towards becoming more consumer first, right? Entering into sports. And I think when you look at sports today, um, it is not just a passion for most people, but I think as a business, the economics make phenomenal sense, right? Um, and I think for us, the bid was not a bid which was guided by passion. I think for us, um, at work, we are very um, dispassionate as far as our likes come. It's, it's business is business, right? And I think, so the bid was, was very much keeping in mind what we believe was the true value of, of a franchise 
uh, like Lucknow. And, and I think it was just the first of many for us. So we've also got, say, for example, a team in the South uh, Africa Premier League as well. We've got Mohan Bagan Super Giants. And for us, sports is going to be a big thrust area, whether you look at it from a franchise, pers franchise perspective or a team perspective, or even if you kind of venture into esports. So we will be looking at the overall gamut of sports as, as, as we move forward. Yeah, so uh, esports is uh, interesting. You know, digital sports, the way it is shaping up, what do you foresee going forward? Is fantasy games something that's on your mind? Is digital sports, how big? are you going to be thinking of capturing this market into what are you thinking so i think like i said for us it's still relatively new we've been in the space for the last three years um and i think we strongly believe in that business potential um i think we are still analyzing further but we are certain that sports is going to be one of the mainstays for the group going forward Okay. Keshav, uh, let me ask you, you know, you funded uh, so many digital uh, startups, six of them are unicorns as well. Uh, but tell me, why is the new generation really focusing on these kind of businesses and not focusing on the old age businesses like energy, infrastructure, uh, all of those? Is, is there a sense that perhaps those were too regulated, uh, you know, sectors or perhaps too much of uh, government intervention was there? Is that somewhere on the back of the mind when you're thinking about these? You know, of the 111 unicorns in India, 65% are in the regulated space of financial services. So actually, people don't uh, realize that most of the unicorns are actually regulated directly or indirectly. What I think people do is they find a problem statement in India and they build something. And most of these companies are built by first-time entrepreneurs from a small town. They've gone into an IIT or gone somewhere and realized, okay, there's a great potential and they have nothing to lose. So if you meet any entrepreneur today, they're just phenomenal, they're limitless in their ideas, uh, anything can be disrupted and can create insane value. So I think when, when, when an entrepreneur comes in and, and the best thing that um, we can do, or as a venture capital firm that I run from the family office side, we actually just support them and we say, we will take an exit when you do. Uh, and you know, that really builds a lot of trust. So of the six unicorns, I think we've been there six to eight years at least in each of them. But we see that, you know, for the best returns for any company, it takes two decades. So if you see when SoftBank invested in, you know, uh, Alibaba or Tencent with, uh, with, with the Naspers, it took 18 to 20 years. Uh, so I think we're also looking at a longer duration where these companies become massive companies uh, over the next few decades. So when could be the next Alibaba coming in from India, you know, and uh, be that large in its extent? No, hopefully. I think... Coming uh, from you. <laughs> no, no, fabulous. I think, uh, you know... Take, we were just talking about it earlier, but of the 10 largest companies in the world today, two of them are AI companies, uh, and then two of them are pharma companies, right? Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk. That, they've been propelled due to technology, due to finding or drug discovery um, in, a, in a potential area which has insane potential, which is, you know, weight loss. Um, you know, we do that in our pharma service business. We see so much... Uh, you know, moving to a gene therapy or CRISPR or new age technologies which are going to change the landscape of our health ecosystem. So I think it's super exciting. It's the best time to build in India. It's the best time to fund companies in India because, you know, all our stars are aligned uh, in all true respects. And you were talking about the L.I. Lilly's uh, weight loss drug which has become the talk of the town right now. Is something like that coming in from you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that, that, Eli Lilly and Nova Nordisk. But those are... <laughs> Uh, those are phenomenal uh, success stories. You know, you could have never imagined or even had a chance to think that these would be a couple hundred billion dollar companies and, and closing, inching into a trillion dollar company. So, um, you know, the days have changed and so, so do all of us have to. So. Okay. Tell me, Shashwat, about the challenges that were, uh, you know, faced by previous generation entrepreneurs and how have the challenges changed in your time? Are things easier for you to do business in India now? So I think, uh, I mean, it's difficult to say the challenges that the previous generation faced, but I think they had, for a large part of their careers, a license raj, which kind of changed at some point, and there was a, a flux in terms of how business was to be done. But I think where we are today, um, I think we are in India's golden age. And, and I say that um, with all my heart, I think, um, I think in Prime Minister Modi, we've got um, one of the strongest leaders that the world has ever seen, um, a visionary and someone with a very strong bias for action and someone who's able to instill that bias for action in almost every Indian. It is, I think, you know, when you look at a large part of Indian heritage, it was a very pehle up kind of a heritage, right? And I think he's kind of changed that. And if I can use my uh, Lucknow 
uh, tagline for that. It's, you know, he's made it up apni bari hai. There is no reason to walk with your head, you know, kind of down. You should be proud of who you are. You should believe in yourself and you should trust yourself and, and have that courage of conviction to be able to do whatever you think you want to do, right? And I think that's, that's what Keshav was also saying is out of the over 100 unicorns and a lot of these out of India have come in the last three to four years and, and India hasn't seen that in the past. So I think with that, I think there is no reason why anybody shouldn't be in business and shouldn't be in business in India. I think there is enough for entrepreneurs to do in India. Uh, we have a superbly young demographic um, and we have to reap that dividend essentially. Um, and I think um, India is yet, the world is yet to see I think the India story. So. Okay, the world is yet to see the India story, but ab apni bari has, like you said. Uh, what about you, uh, Kesha? Do you also feel that uh, the economic landscape, the way it has changed over the last few years for India, is it become, um, has it become more conducive for new age entrepreneurs or is it more challenging? I think it's become extremely conducive. Uh, you know, there's no doubt about that. Because what has happened is we are at a, at a golden era between geopolitically, where Prime Minister Modi has placed us in the right position, in terms of demographically, that everybody knows, and then economically as well, right? The, the pace at which we're growing. And also, counterintuitively, it's a zero-sum game globally. You know, China's loss is India's gain. It's so evident, right? The China plus one strategy, so many aspects of companies coming to India, not finding aspects of investing globally. So I think that is going to be the error. So we need to ensure there's good policy, which is being done. There needs to be like capital coming in. There needs to be opportunities. And there needs to be transparency of those policies and governance. And I think that will lead India to being a phenomenal uh, nation. And I think we are super excited more than ever to be part of uh, India and its growth story. Yeah, you know, but uh, there's this one missing link that everybody talks about that private capex has not picked up. Uh, do you think that uh, there is a change in which uh, new age entrepreneurs are thinking of how to deploy money, how to make their money, perhaps because we're looking at the stock markets, we're looking at the Bitcoin, we're looking at the financial world, the way they have immediate gratification coming in from you put that money there, you'll see it grow 10x. But do you think that that is the reason why private capex is suffering? No, I think private capex has nothing to do with uh, people investing personal capital. Uh, private capex will come. If you see the, the, the middle class is becoming so wealthy uh, and you see that everywhere. Uh, you know, you go to a hotel, you take a flight, you go anywhere, right? It's becoming so wealthy that the whole landscape of private capex is going to change in this decade as well. And I think that's already starting to happen. If you see the investments in new energy, you see the uh, investments in other aspects of business, I think that's going to happen very quickly. On software side, of course, it's, it's a very different landscape. It's a lot of foreign capital that comes in. And I think people are investing in people. And I think that which is our biggest resource. Absolutely. So when you talk about people, a lot of uh, corporates are setting different guidelines, different rules for more inclusivity when it comes to women first policies, maybe transgender inclusion as well. What is your thought process? Are you doing that or such things in your companies as well? I mean, we are, I'm running a software company right now. So we don't wear jackets, suits. It's a very different landscape. <laughs> and we're exclu ex exclusively like... <laughs> Uh, inclusivity is really important for us yeah. and um, you know as uh, you know if you're the, the best leaders that I know are actually ladies yeah. you know they they are great managers of people of capital of resources and I've seen so many boards that I'm part of that you know the people I admire so I think that's going to change and you're going to see a lot of inclusion you're already seeing that at the helm of all uh, large companies as well so super excited we we always support and we try to actually hire if there are two people and if there's a female who's leading it we will always hire the person there. okay Shash what do you want to add to that completely echo his sentiments and I think uh, for us um, you know um, we have over 55,000 employees and, and today we're at about 45% of them are women. Um, and this story was very different as recently as seven years ago, right? And I think uh, one thing that I completely echo that Keshav said is, um, you know, women are by far, I think, better multitaskers, better leaders. They are able to think better, to act better, to do better, right? Um, so I think what's changed is, is the role of male and female in society. And I think as that's changing and more women are coming into the workforce, you are seeing them taking on more leadership roles. Mm. And I think 
that is going to be a large part of India's success story as well. Okay, that's a wonderful point. But tell me, you know, from previous generation to now, how has the way you do business changed or is changing, you're bringing in change in your companies the way, and you say to your father that, you know, you don't know this, I know this better, I'm going to be doing this this way. If I told my father that, I'm not sure how, how well that would go <laughs> on a lighter note. But, but I think the way we do business is significantly different, right? I think, I think the ways and means of doing business um, three decades ago versus doing business today yeah. is very different. Dealings are a lot more transparent. Mm -hmm. Corporate governance is of paramount importance. Transparency is important. Um, and I think what's also changed is the kind of workforce that you're able to get where uh, they want to be partners with you in that journey of creating wealth, in that journey of creating equity for themselves. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the sense of accountability, the sense of responsibility is much higher in them. And I think, um, so I think a large part of the success that all of us see is because of the people who work with us. Um, and, and so therefore, it's changed from being, I think, leadership back in the day may have been more top-down, more authoritarian. I think today, it's really more about more participative, more collective, mm -hmm. and that's what's leading you to do better things and have Wonderful. better outcomes. Uh, Keshav, is there anything that you want to really imbibe from your dad and from your previous generation while you're doing business? Or is there something that you want to really change and you want to actually? in? No, I've been uh, very blessed and grateful uh, from my grandfather's side on both sides, GVK yeah. Reddy and TSR Reddy, and my parents, uh, Pinky and Sanjay. I think I've been very lucky and fortunate. There's nothing I would ever change. So yeah. in that sense, I think, uh, you know, we have to take on the responsibility and, and be very grateful and build, you know, opportunities for us, for the country, for everyone around. So I think that's the only thing I, I think I you say. want to take the fitness lessons from your dad more. <laughs> My dad is extremely fit. He, he's doing a triathlon at 60, so. Yeah. And are you also as into fitness? No, not as much as him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, would you like to like at least aspire to be that? I think he's already, uh, you know, tried two Iron Man challenges, right? That's right. He's already done them. So. And at this age, at, at this age, that's correct. And does that make life more uh, difficult for you? And no, not a, actually, it's really exciting because I do uh, long distance cycling with him. So okay. we go for like fifty to hundred kilometer cycling. You know, at four thirty-five in the morning. So it's it's really enjoyable because we have similar passions. So uh, a okay. lot of fun. Right, Shashwat, what's your passion? You're not into fitness at all. You told me. I mean, well, not into it at all in the sense it's not a passion. I do it because I think I should. Um, and I think, um, like in his case as well, I think dad is definitely very into fitness as well. Um, he does a one and a half hour walk every day, a one hour workout every day. So that's, that's a lot of uh, time that goes into being fit. Uh, so definitely something that I do, but, but it's not my passion. Um, I think for me, surprisingly, one of the things um, that I love to do is actually cook. And for me, uh, that's, that's a big stress buster. Mm. Uh, and for us, it's now become a family, family activity where both Shivika and I do it. And now my daughter is almost three. And we're starting to get her into it. So it's a fun Sunday activity. What's that all the three best of us meal that you've cooked for your family till date? You'll have to ask them, uh, <laughs> but I'd like to think I cook most things well. So is, is Sunday lunch or on you like always? Absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, great to speak to both of you. Many thanks and uh, thanks a lot uh, audiences for being so patient and listening and looks like, you know, our future is going to be very, very bright. We saw Florina, but uh, flag bearers are definitely taking it way forward. Many, many thanks for being with us for this very Thank special you, conversation. Thank you, Sarge. All the very best to both Thank of you. you. Thank you.